Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Last uh, session of the day, so that's great. Um, I love Boston. I'm very happy to be here today, and I have two reasons for that. The first reason is that Boston was the first city in the United States of America I visited 20 years ago. I came here to study English for a month, and hopefully all of you can notice my Boston accent. <laughs> right. Second reason, and a little bit more important, is that today we're introducing hyperscale for OpenStack. It's a software-defined storage solution that has been built for OpenStack Cloud. Today, we're going to cover how Hyperscale for OpenStack can provide quality of service, performance, and data protection built on software that can be used with the commodity hardware of your choice to help customers to move more workloads into OpenStack clouds. My name is Carlos Carrero. I'm a product manager working for Veritas for the last 16 years. Um, today, I have the pleasure to have with me uh, Ruth Harpson, uh, CEO for Fairbanks, one of the key partners in Netherlands, they are uh, OpenStack ambassadors in Netherlands. They have been working with us in all this way, providing feedback and validation of what we're doing. So I will introduce you in a while. Before, I want to introduce my colleague and also friend, uh, Abhijit Day, our Vice President for Engineering. It's just because you have been two years more than me in the company, uh, why don't you cover a little bit about you know, what's Veritas, what's the the vision and what are we doing here. Okay, thanks Carlos. Um, yeah, Abhijit, some of you know me, I think most of you know me. I've uh, been in this company for a very long time actually, 18 months, 18 years, sorry, 18 years. <laughs> I wish 18 months. Jet so, lag, it's jet lag. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll present the company, but you know, today Veritas has emerged from, you know, we used to be acquired by Symantec. One year back we got Freedom. Uh, we are run by um, world's biggest equity investor, uh, Carlyle Investment. Um, in a startup mode, it's great for us who built the original startup called Veritas to kind of come out into a stealth mode startup now. And it gives us opportunity to again re-emerge as the storage and data protection leader that we used to be, right? So today the company is organized into really three broad sections. Um, data management or storage management that we proudly do for the last 25 years. Um, we did the first file system, volume manager, the industry had seen over Unix. The second portfolio is the data protection or uh, um, backup. Backup is our flagship product today. Uh, we uh, call it net backup. Um, and then the third portfolio is the data insight. Data insight um, ranges across the solutions that we have around data governance, data insight, looking at data, visibility of the data. That's really what Veritas is. It's very simple. Data management, data protection, and data governance, right? So what, what the heck happened? You had to click on the right button. That's the right button. Okay, cool. So quickly on our history, right? Because it's, it's from the past, you know how to learn the future. We have been you know, innovating in storage management for a long time. First volume manager Unix world had seen First file system, truly POSIX-based file system, which we still ship called cluster file system. And then the first HA or VCS solution the industry had seen back in the days, 1999, 2000. Moving on to that, we are adopting and emerging and reshaping ourselves to do multi-cloud. Customers are going to go to multi-cloud no matter what. That's the next world we are going to see for many years. And then software-defined storage. Software-defined storage is a term, industry, I uh, used last four or five years, but we actually defined software defined before it was a cool term, really. Um, if you look at volume manager file system, this is a way of how do you uh, provision storage, manage storage in a software defined way. So we are emerging there, right? That's really where we are, we are coming into OpenStack. OpenStack is a great um, venture. It's a in front in IAS. It's a great infrastructure for us to add values in storage and backup, the things that we do, and we do better than many people, right? Many other um, vendors, right? And we are trying to add value. This is a great opportunity for us to really add value in a more open architecture, agnostic way. We are checking in all the sources to open source. So this is a great idea. Personally, OpenStack, this is my, I, think, I don't know, ninth or 10th, whatever number of OpenStack has happened. It's, a, it's almost like a festival, a religious thing for me to show up and talk in this. So I'm extremely honored to be now with Carlos and Ruth 
to talk about and launch the product on stage in um, OpenStack Summit Boston, right? So with that, I'll let Rud talk about his company. Thanks. Okay, Abhijit, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Ruud Harmsen. I'm the CEO of Fairbanks, and we are uh, a Dutch uh, IT uh, company. And we are in the open source business now since uh, 2011. And the reason we choose for open source is because it gives customers ability to innovate, gives them flexibility and scalability, and also cost savings. And uh, we see a lot of examples uh, like uh, Uber and Airbnb, uh, what can uh, give them a competitive advantage by innovative and flexible IT solutions. And that's the reason we are in this business. Um, in the last couple of years, we built uh, a lot of clouds for our customers. And we did it with uh, several distributions, uh, but uh, now we have a very, very good relationship with uh, Canonical, and we build our clouds with Ubuntu and Canonical. And in uh, 2014, I received a phone call uh, from uh, a friend of mine within Veritas. And he phoned me and he said, Ruth, uh, before I gonna say anything, you have to sign an NDA. And at that time, I thought, wow, if somebody calls me in the evening and wants to explain me something and I have to sign an NDA, it should be important. So I received the NDA, I signed it, and a couple of days later, I went in a meeting with, um, uh, with Veritas. And um, I am really very proud that we as Fairbanks have uh, the opportunity to help Veritas develop uh, hyperscale as where it is right now. And yesterday it was the launch of a real very, very good product. Um, to work in the open source uh, community, you have to add value. And we do that in several ways. We have partners, some partners in Europe, uh, who don't have the expertise of uh, OpenStack, and we help them uh, developing and improving ICT and marketing concepts to bring their business forward. We also have customers uh, where we uh, act as a cloud uh, specialist and broker of modular and open source cloud solutions. And of course, we have our end users who we help and build our clouds. Um, the target market for, uh, uh, for Fairbanks, we have service providers and end users. And as I said before, you can see the picture for our service providers, our customers. We developed a service extender, which means that above on his services, we can help them to improve their business. And of course, our end users, where we build uh, an internal of external private cloud for the customers in the Netherlands and also in Europe. Good. Well, thank you. you. I think it's great introduction, and again, thank you very much for being with us during all this all this time. So, when we take a look to what problems are we solving for OpenStack, we concentrate on three key areas. The first one is that uh, we had to change the mindset about thinking about the storage as a whole of a storage or a volume that you go and use. And you had to think more about the workloads. So which are the specific needs you have for the workloads? You can have things like MySQL. You can have things like Cassandra. Do they need the same requirements? So typically what you find is that it's one size fits all. So you end having maybe three copies for everything. Do you need three copies for your analytic workload, which is running on memory, and you have three, copy, three copies on memory, and then having another three copies, spread three copies, spread three copies? And it's just about the number of copies. It's about how you're using the I.O., which is go to the next point, is that how do you really get the performance that you need? And definitely there is some progress on, on working on the community about quality of service, okay? But how you can guarantee the quality of service that this define for your specific workload. And make sure that at the end you get the mass of your hardware. Because you can be using commodity hardware, but how do you make sure you get the base of that? And I think here we're going to be talking about the architecture and the mindset, so I'll begin to introduce a little bit of the history. Three years ago, we started this project called OpenFlame, that today is hyperscale, okay? And that hyperscale was a mindset change, about we had to do something different in how we provide this. And this is the, the, one of the key things, is that change the mindset about the workload, because that is what really matters, okay? And when we think about that, the third point, which is not very well solved, 
or unsolved is how do you protect those closed workloads? What is the protection? We, as Veritas, as the backup company, it's key for us, and we always saw in the key notes that more customers are moving workloads into production. That's clear, because more customers are asking us about how do I protect my workload? If you need protection, that means that it matters for you. So to solve this, we are introducing Hyperscale for OpenStack. The first distribution that we announced EA yesterday is based on Canonical. I really appreciate Canonical, all the help to, to go DA first. Uh, in our NDA is to be agnostic. And of course, we're working with other vendors. We're working very closely with Red Hat, They're helping a lot. Um, we are planning to be with them by the end of the year. And we have SUSE, we have Mimantis. It's our NDA. So I did talk about so we define a storage. Uh, we did that agnostic to any hardware, to any storage channel network, to any cloud, and of course we have to be agnostic to any technology that you guys may want to use. That's in our NDA. So what we really provide with Hyperscale for OpenStack. So Hyperscale for OpenStack is so we define a storage that is going to allow you to define which is the resiliency level that you need for your workloads. Maybe you need three copies, maybe you need to support two compute failures, one compute failures. That's something you're going to define at the workload level. The second point is that how you can get the predictable performance with quality of service. There is a term very well known in the market, which is a noisy neighbor. Of course, we're solving the noisy neighbor, but not only that, it does we can guarantee a minimum IOS per second. So we're going to see a little bit our architecture, how it works, to make sure that at the end, your workloads is going to get the performance that I need. Because it's a cloud environment. So I don't know what instances are going to be running and where they're going to be running. So I had to make sure I create mechanisms within my storage so that my workloads can run wherever they want, but they are going to get the performance that they need. And the third point is the backup integration, or not backup, I call data management without impact. What we're going to see is an architecture that really separates the performance for the data management, and it's going to help you to really do a, what we call zero backup window, or run a backup whatever you want, right? So before jumping into Abhijit, uh, if we take a look to what we can compare with the traditional so we define storage architectures, that are based on a single layer, okay, is that where you have your hyperconverse, the servers, the storage, the memory, right? And we have been there. I mean, again, we create our file system 1995, 1924. We have cluster file system. The last version for cluster file system that, as you guys, I love, support up to 128 nodes using commodity hardware and local storage. But the problem with that is that everything is on the same place. So you have this noisy neighbor problem where all the instances are going to be running there, and you have to make sure you fix that because you don't know what they're going to be running. The second issue is that everything is on the same plane. What I mean with that is the copy that I need now and the copy I need for resiliency are happening on the same place. And if I go to typical things like one site fits all, where you get three copies for everything, it's not about the number of three copies, as you and I was talking yesterday, is that the number of IOs that I have to do. Because I make a write, and then I make nine writes. But where I do those nine writes? On the same layer. So everything is there. So we took a step back, I think it was three years ago, and said, we have to rethink how we make this thing. Okay? So I think that was a challenge for engineering that was really well presented, and a bit. I'm going to let you cover Sure. What you guys have to do. Thanks, Carlos. And, you know, interestingly, what you said, uh, it appeared to me again and again that if you have multiple copies, it's not a bad thing, right, necessarily, because you need copies for resiliency and HA purpose, DR purpose. So you need copies. But point is, when you go into hyperconverged or cloud computing, right, you are mostly going to be using Flash for your local compute storage. Now you have these copies of the data so many times in the Flash storage. And that's going to be also very expensive because you're using two thirds of your data center on flash storage, which are just simply copying the primary data. And that's where we wanted to rethink, right? And so, you know, and thanks, Carlos. That is a great introduction. So if you really look at it, we 
thought about this for 20 years and we challenged ourselves to say, well, for cloud architecture, none of this storage architecture which we have today in our legacy and also many other vendors today will scale because you are stuck with one plane, which is called the compute plane, where applications are running like Oracle or CouchDB and where you take the backup, right? Data really has two layers, right? One is the primary consumption, which is applications run, that's the primary usage. We call it primary data. The data has the secondary con consumption, which is backup, ETL, archiving. These are secondary storage. The problem with our architecture traditionally has been we morphed this secondary and primary data into one plane. So what we did was really simple, now that we have it, and we are under NDA, so that we introduced another data plane. We call it a data plane. As you can see, the top is the compute plane, which is a scale-out compute plane, which serves up the application IOPS. And the lower one is the data plane, which is um, here, right here, which is also storing the data, right? But what we do here is, by doing that, like Carlos says quickly, we can now look at solving these problems of quality of storage, because now we have one compute to worry about, one plane to solve where multi-tenant applications are happening. We can look at optimizing the storage consumption, because we can push off all those extra copies to a low-tier secondary storage data plane. We can look at how do we do higher density storage, and finally, how do we do data protection? Because data protection has to be thought of. Now that we have two planes, one is the primary compute and the secondary, secondary data plane, we can actually rethink the whole concept of data protection, where we can say, you know what? We can just take the backup of the data from the secondary plane. We don't have to impact the applications which are running in the primary plane to do backup. That's really the IP here. Right? This is very disruptive, and we have protected this for almost two and a half years, except with partners and chosen customers that we have got a lot of feedback. There are customers among you who have given us a lot of, I mean, I can see Sri and other people, who have given us a lot of feedback on how do we do better. We have definitely morphed, and today we were ready to be GA, so we released the product. So I'll move on. Yep. Is that, okay. so one of the key things is when talking about resiliency, is that I uh, don't know how many of you are familiar with the OpenStack flavor. Uh, I've been talking to some people and maybe not familiar with that, but that's how you define your policies, your SLAs, the type of machine that you need. That is where, like in Amazon, you say, I want this number of CPUs, I need this amount of memory. But what about the storage? With the storage, you today just define, I want 10 gigabytes. What we do to have a real integration is extend on the flavors to say, I need, this resiliency factor, so this is the protection level I want to get, and this is the number of copies I want to have. Because again, my SQL is going to be different from Cassandra. So why I can define different flavors? HyperSQL is going to define by default what we call a, a, a bronze and silver and gold. Very imaginative names, right? So, but you can define your own flavors, or you can add the, the properties to the custom flavors that you want. So you can create your Cassandra flavor if you want and define that. An immediate need of this is the reduce on the hardware needs. So we we'll take a look to the economics and you take a look, remember that single layer, right? When I have my first copy, my second copy, my third copy, my second and my third copy, if I need a third copy, are going to be, we're going to move that down to the data plane. The data plane is going to be high resiliency and cheaper storage. And the third thing is, this is based on commodity hardware. It's totally defined a store, it's based on commodity hardware of your choice. So it's not, this is my software solution and you have to buy my servers, right? No, this is really customized, so you choose whatever you want. And we are going to be talking about the architectures a little bit. So describe a little bit yeah. the, how so, this works. So this is the compute plane. We have used this traditionally in any storage computing, right? This is the compute plane which runs your virtual machines or applications, right? So what we do, this is OpenStack. The instances are the Nova virtual machines which are running your applications workloads, right? There's nothing new here. Now we have extended the flavors, like Carlos mentioned about OpenStack flavors. OpenStack gives you quality of service in a way, right? It gives you bronze, gold, silver, which can be extended. So we did that. And then we said, you know, when application rights are coming, the primary the primary data is in this node, right, which actually gets the application. And then we replicate the delta changes. We do not copy the entire file over and over again 
into this peer computes. That's what the traditional solutions would be. That's how you end up with multiple copies. All we do is we take the delta changes from the last 15 minutes or so, which is a tunable, and we say let's only keep the last writes right, into the peer compute nodes. That's the resiliency level. But then you'd ask then, well, you don't really have a full copy of the file anywhere. Right? That's the next question. That's where we said, you know what, we can disrupt this. We can say, well, you can, you can use this data, you can store this data from the primary compute plane every episodic interval. We call it episodic data sync. But every episodic interval, you can say, well, I can store this, flush them to the secondary storage. Now, the beauty of this design is once you are done flushing them into the secondary storage, you can remove those deltas or replicas that you had in the primary compute. So you end up with one primary copy in your flash tier and one secondary copy in your cheap and deep secondary storage tier. That's really the solution, right? Now, if you really look at it, this is all works with OpenStack. Of course, we had to upgrade the uh, Cinder driver to look at local flash storage. We had to upgrade the Nova to look at the filters that Nova provides to upgrade them to use this design. So think of this like an entire Intuit storage management for OpenStack, right? Now, this is a storage technology, but we call it also end-to-end -end because now that you have the data in your secondary node, right, you can take a backup simply from that node. That's really the architecture. So sim the other thing to point out is that these four nodes, we are showing four here, these are scalable, infinitely scalable, because there is no strong clustering between these nodes. They are not connected by a heartbeat network like other solutions, even our legacy solutions had, right? They are layer three network, each node comes and goes. You can infinitely, infinitely scale the compute node. You can infinitely scale the data node. So your storage needs don't dominate. Your application grows faster, application needs. The storage does not have to grow that way. They can scale linearly, right? So I'll pass over to Ruud to talk about. Thank you. Um, well, you heard something about uh, resiliency and uh, quality of service. But one of the first slides of um, uh, this presentation, you also saw something about performance. And this is a real case where we were uh, dealing with a few years ago. Uh, this is a, a Dutch supermarket, it's called uh, the Spar. And they came to us and said, uh, Fairbanks, can you help us building a cloud where we can have uh, IOPS, uh, and uh, a lot of IOPS, because they build an application uh, uh, on an Oracle database. And what they, what they do is, uh, and that's their unique selling point, there is a guy who is working in the supermarket at the time. There is a product. He, it, the, the, the shelf is empty. Um, uh, he pushed the button. Uh, the ghost information uh, uh, to the warehouse. There is a guy who picks the products, put it into a container, container into the lorry, lorry to uh, the store, and they build it very sufficient, uh, very high qualified. But um, uh, if you uh, look about uh, for elastic clouds, then you definitely need uh, uh, performance. So uh, we did a lot of testing, and at the end, we had to decide uh, not to use Ceph, because Ceph was not able to solve this issue, and they had to go back to the standard uh, solution like SAN technology. And uh, uh, because of the, the, the stress test we, uh, uh, we did for this customer, you saw with the elastic cloud, uh, necessary they were looking for, it was not possible to use Ceph. And we really believe that uh, together with a product like Hyperscale, we definitely can solve solutions uh, for our customers uh, in the market. Good? Yeah. Oh, I will. Thank you, Dan. We will make sure we get that. So that goes to the predictable performance with quality of service. Uh, the way I see that, and, and we have seen different solutions uh, uh, on the market, is that you have quality of service that you can define for each of the flavors or each of the workloads. Again, how I can have a um, critical database running uh, today in OpenStack, and I can make sure I can run other workloads, like web servers, application servers, and everything is going to get that. So using my um, artistic skills, I try to represent that with different regions, where you can go and share and say, this is, I have this workload that needs this high performance. I have these other workloads that need a different performance. One of the things we do by default is to avoid the noisy neighbor. So that means is that now any uh, instance is going to keep under control and it's, going to, it's not going to make any noise that is going to affect the performance of other ones. And one of the key points is accelerate performance. 
So what we do is that we keep that first copy in the compute plane, which is running where your workload is there. So the CPU and the storage are together. We also use SSDs to our flash to accelerate the performance, to accelerate writes and do that protection that the Begit was talking about and make sure that that, that write is protected, but it's protected in a very effective way. So let's see the how part. Carlos gets to tell me what to do, and I get to do the how part of it with my team. Some of you are here. So you did well. So basically, so basically, what again? Uh, just listen to me because the slides cannot explain. This is a pretty complicated algorithm. But OpenStack actually you have two minutes to say the algorithm. Yes, yes. yes. In case, okay? OpenStack introduces quality of service by adding flavors to the virtual machine when you create or instantiate a virtual machine. These are called gold, silver, bronze. With the, each tier, you get a performance guarantee. But then OpenStack does not really solve the storage problem. As an IAS provider, it's not OpenStack's job. It's vendor's job to look at it. But OpenStack tries to solve it um, QoS or quality of service at the source level, at the, at the source level where the virtual machine issues the I.O. What really needs to be done is to solve the storage quality of service at the devices in, we call it the destination, where the data is being written. So what we do is we simply assign the application a sort of credit system. We say, how prioritized is the application? Is it my Oracle or is it a noisy neighbor? The noisy neighbor is not prioritized. The Oracle gets prioritized. We take that weights or credits, we call it, and we transfer that understanding the system. Then we go back to the device and we understand the device latencies for that application. Then we map that to, and then we say, who gets to write? If the Oracle came with a very high max, I, max IOPS and min IOPS, a higher priority with a gold level, we let the Oracle flow in, and the noisy neighbor automatically does not get the share of the storage. It's deprioritized. That's really the quality of service. Now, this is something, of course, happens within a physical node. You have a multi-tenant physical node. You can say, well, I'll assign priorities and do quality of service between the workloads. That's how we do quality of service. Our vision is to also take that and map that into entire compute plane where you can do quality of service across physical nodes. That's coming up later in the roadmap. So with that, I'll let Carlos or, or Ruth talk about, yep. oh, Carlos. So this is quality of service on, on action, and I understand it's a very complex slide. So let me go through the key things. This is, think about your database running where you have defined your flavors. You want a minimum IS per second of 10,000 and a maximum of 20,000 IS per second. You have some application servers between 5 and 10K. And what happened here is that I start my database running. It goes to the limit of 20K. Uh, I have the application server goes to the 5K. And then what I'm doing is I'm starting what I call noisy neighbors with no control. What is happening is that my database gets impacted because I have an, a number of IOS per second I can share in my compute that's get impacted, but it's going to get just impacted to the minimum IOS per second. That's the, the low band that I have on the 10K IOS per second for my database, for my goal. So at the end, what I can do is to have a better share of resources within my system. But also what I have is the capability to at one point in time go and limit. Say, no, you are web servers. We're not going to get more than 1,000 IOS per second. And the moment I do that, and I can do that online, is that then my database and my application server goes back to the balance that they have. Something I can do also is to recover that and say, yeah, now I have more bandwidth, so the database is going to raise to 25K. So I can give you 25K and get the performance. So this is an interesting uh, uh, example because we're having 60 thousand IOS per second in a compute plane. And of course, this is going to depend on what hardware you have. This is uh, one SSD card on four HDDs, that's all. And this is a scaling. Uh, in this testing, we're running eight nodes having the same performance from each of those eight nodes. So that's close to 480K IOS per second in an eight node cluster using commodity hardware, right? Thank you. <coughs> um, we discussed and picked this example out of uh, our customers. Uh, it's uh, the name of the company it's revised and it's a service provider. And what we see in uh, the area where we are working, which is the Benelux, 
Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the area around a bit of UK and Germany, we see that those uh, service providers, um, uh, they work still on a traditional way. They use their traditional software, they earn money with the customers, the customers bring the uh, 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 VMs and, uh, on their platform, and that's where they make money with. And we believe that together with uh, uh, the cloud uh, software like OpenStack, you really can bring more uh, technology uh, and more service for your customer. So uh, Revised came to us and said, uh, Fairbanks, can you help us building a cloud? Uh, we are really uh, uh, lo looking for reduce of costs and we don't want to have uh, a vendor lock in. Uh, but the quality of services for a service provider could be and maybe should be very interesting for their customers. So he has his SLA to his customers and with a different quality of services, he can help his customer. So now with this product, uh, like Hyperscale, um, well, we are, uh, uh, we can't wait. Uh, Abhijit, we talked several times now, we can't wait to bring this uh, to the market because we really believe it brings something for our customers like uh, uh, the service providers but also uh, the large enterprises. Good. Thank you, Ruth. And I think lastly, but not less important, or even more important, is the data protection part. Okay. If you have understood the explanation from Abhijit, and I hope everybody understood Abhijit quite well. You don't have a Boston accent like me, but that's fine. Uh, you have this port in time copy, which is happening at the data plane every 15 minutes. That's my first line of defense, if you want. Those copies are going to be in your timeline, your view of horizon. So in your UI, you're going to see how many copies you have. You can go anytime, click on any of them, and, and do a restore. More important is that we're using that data plane and the copies we have at the data plane to provide a zero backup window. I hope you understand right now you can run a backup wherever you want. That backup is going to go to the data plane. And of course, we're, in, we're integrating with net backup. And I'm going to show you a very quick demo about how it works. Yes, with one click, you can define what do you want to back up when and how. Cool. Yeah, so thanks, Carlos. So, so basically, it's now that we have gone through many times, but we'll reinforce, right? This is the data plane you're looking at. You're looking at the point in time copies that's coming from the compute node, right? On the, on the left arrow there. So the, it's a version storage, right? So you got the original data of the file, could be a VMDK. And then you got the incremental snapshots, 15 minute deltas that are now accumulated in the data node. Now it's a matter of taking that data from this data node into any backup vendor, in this case, our flagship product net backup. So now you got the data, you just over API, right? You send it to a backup device. And then the beauty is now you can restore it back. And once you restore it back, it's a one click restore from the UI horizon. Once you restore it back, now you can rehydrate it back. We call it rehydration, which is meaning taking the data from the data plane back to the compute plane. Now you can re-instantiate, rerun your application based on that data that you are restoring it from. That's really the end-to-end OpenStack net backup or OpenStack backup. That's something that not many vendors have been able to do. But because of this disruptive design, we have now not only solved an OpenStack cloud backup, but also more importantly is we are not going to impact the application. The data is already here. So we don't have to go back and take an application quizing all the time. For crash consistency, this is perfect. For application consistency, you still have to say back up now from the compute node. The data still shows up in the data node, and then it's a matter of taking that data and tier it to your backup device. You could even take it to the cloud, right? That's kind of how the data protection portion of the solution works. Good. Thank you. <coughs> uh, another example. Um, and that's what, what you said, uh, Abhijit, and also you, uh, uh, Carlos. Uh, I really believe, and I see a lot of examples uh, in the market. Uh, enterprises, uh, but also universities and uh, 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 other companies, uh, they really have a problem. If you talk about private cloud, and then what can you do with your backup? And you said that maybe uh, uh, not many vendors, I think you are the only one who really has uh, a solution for a backup. For instance, for this customer, like uh, the University of Luxembourg, um, what they do is uh, they work with several universities all over the world and do research on very difficult diseases uh, and bring information uh, to, all the other uh, to all the other universities. 
And every time when I speak with the CIO, together with my colleagues, we have visited this customer, they ask, how can we solve this issue? Because it's very, very high valuable. You can't uh, put a price on it because th that information is so, so valuable for those organizations that they really want to uh, keep it for themselves with all, the other, uh, with all the other universities, but they don't want to lose the information. So they're really looking for a solution like what you have right now. I'm pretty sure about that. Yeah. So let me show you a quick demo how uh, this really works. And is, this is out-of-the-box integration with NetBackup. The way it works is that now this is your Horizon UI. You can see hyperscale tab. You're going to see backups. So in the NetBackup site, you just create a policy. That policy is going to define when you backup. Within um, OpenStack, you're going to define for this policy, when this policy is happening, uh, this is what I want to do. And you want to do is I want to backup based on a flavor, or a flavor and a name, or a flavor on the state. So you de really define what do you want to backup. Then when that backup is happening, that's going to the data plane. The data plane moves the data to the net backup. And then within the UI, you're going to have the visibility of what backups do you have. You can just go and click in one of the images you have, do a restore. That restore is going to talk to net backup. It's going to bring the data from whatever it is back to the data plane. And then from the data plane, you are going to instantiate a new instance that you will have in just with uh, really uh, one click uh, restore. So again, out of the box integration. Uh, so I asked for my folks in engineering about, hey, I want to see a proof of uh, uh, how this uh, how this works, you know, how that's not affect performance. And it's a very silly thing because I have uh, 25 instances running, having this performance, and I said, okay, now run a backup. Yeah, they have the same performance. So I don't know if I make a graph with just a flat line, okay, this will be a silly slide, but that is the result, that is what really happens. So when talking, uh, summarizing a little bit about the, the value props that we have, and when we think about the economics of the solution, okay, is that you think about that single layer that I presented in a traditional software defined a storage solution. And if you are ending having three copies everywhere, okay, the proposal with hyperscale architecture is that that first copy is going to be in your compute planes. If you want to do an all flash, all SSD, and you have a lot of vendors here talking about flash, I can keep the first copy in flash if you want. That's what I need. The second, the third copy, whatever you need, it's going to be on your data plane. That's going to be higher density and cheaper storage. And not only that, is that hopefully you realize that what's happening is that the IO paths are much more better utilized. So now I have the east-west network where I have my resiliency, my compute, my compute is optimized for performance. My data plane is made for data management. So at the end, if you have the hardware, you have the software, you have all the components, we really have, we can have a very a good proposal in our uh, TCO model for our customers. Yep. So, thanks, Carlos. Um, so, if you re really look at it summarily, this is OpenStack's Horizon console, right? What we have done as a storage vendor, right, who understands storage, we have added a storage persona to OpenStack's Horizon. So, when you have OpenStack installed, you will see these dashboards, which you don't see with OpenStack Vanilla. If you can look at it, there's really nothing here about IP. So we are actually showing the primary compute plane. That's the primary compute on the top. The, data, the secondary storage data plane is there. You will see all your virtual machines. You can drill down to the applications, to your physical nodes. You can see the performance characteristics. Carlos talked about backup. You can drill down which virtual machine you want to backup. You can do all of that right from Horizon. So we have pinned down into Horizon, checked in the changes, of course, it's needed to open source, contributing into the community, which we want to do. And then that's what you see when you install the product on OpenStack, be it Canonical or Red Hat or Mirantis or any other distro. Because we are distro agnostic. Right? We are cloud agnostic. The other last point I want to mention is that this is a storage technology. We are taking this technology from OpenStack into containers like Dockers and Kubernetes, and we are already working on solutions because this storage technology is a cloud scalable, hyper-converged software-defined technology. There's nothing really pinning down to OpenStack 
OpenStack is our launch ground to get the product going and solutions tested with you customers who are going into the OpenStack journey. But we are going to take this technology, move into Docker's and other cloud-friendly ecosystem. With that, I'll, I'll move to Carlos. Yeah. So please visit us in the booth. Uh, we are just here. This is Ben here, we're director of engineering, thinking about what's the next thing he's going to be building. And with that, we will finish with a video from our friends. Come on, sound. From the stack, is it working? Good. Hi there, we are Fairbanks. We are part of the OpenStack community, a community of users and developers building the ubiquitous open source cloud computing platform. The use of OpenStack cloud software gives you the ability to innovate. The get up and running is very quick and efficient. We help you to avoid a vendor lock-in with 24-7 production grade support, save costs and you pay as you go. Increase your strength with innovative cloud solutions. We build a stable working OpenStack cloud for your unique needs and provide you with training and support. The OpenStack.nl sandbox is the simplest way to try out OpenStack cloud software. Therefore, we've built a continuously growing OpenStack test environment with hardware that has been made available by several suppliers. The use of the OpenStack.nl sandbox is free. Here you can test how your applications operate on an OpenStack environment. Sign up for the OpenStack.nl sandbox. Good. So that's great, and I think it's an invitation for Yes, yes. So um, uh, we built uh, the sandbox uh, just to give everyone the ability to uh, see how OpenStack works. But also now with, uh, with Hyperscale, uh, uh, I think we did the sign up when you arrived here in this, uh, uh, to listen to this presentation. So uh, we will come back to you uh, and give you the ability to uh, sign in to, for, the, uh, for the sandbox and there you can see how uh, OpenStack together with uh, Hyperscale uh, works for you. Good. So was that. We really want to thank you, all of you, for being here. I don't know if we have time for questions, or it's very late, but any questions you may have. Um, any quick questions now, or we can or always meet at the booth tomorrow? We can stay here, too. Thank you, guys. I think uh, nice solution. I think uh, the QAS and tiering kind of helps. Some of the solution we've been challenged with at Verizon Wireless was, how do we provide a instance local storage with low latency and high bandwidth that could be Couchbase or Cassandra or some of the databases that you have that requires lowest latency possible so that you can, you can do a lot more throughput across the instances that you have, the cluster that you built. So I think what the hyperscale kind of we're trying to figure out trying to work with it so far is to provide the ability for the instance to get the local storage and have that affinity defined so that the instance will have local storage, by the way, high performance storage, when I say local storage, don't mistake me for just local storage. We want to put SSDs or NVMEs or maybe flashcards to get that high performance route, but coming from the local storage to the local instance so that you can build that cluster and say, okay, uh, instance you have your high performance storage locally available to you and go crank it up your database as fast as you can so i think that's the kind of use case we're trying to do and i think thank you guys uh, abhijit and nilesh and all these guys to kind of get some poc going on so just want to let you know we're almost there <laughs> thank you um, hey, thank you it's good, good to hear from fairbanks also that you guys are already putting into production and thank you're you seeing the use cases already that's good so I think we just got a lot more cranking up to do, but in the meantime, uh, just uh, good, good to be, good to be working with you guys. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. We That's really appreciate you coming along pleasure. and helping us shape the product. And again, uh, again, this in the open source community, this is like fun for us engineers, right? You can see the source code of other vendors. Who knew? And then you can contribute, right? That's that's really what we are doing. Uh, again, of course, there's a business aspect of it, but it's glad to be here among the community. And today is doing awesome. really historic day for us to be doing something for OpenStack, actually contributing into the open source and then helping customers as they move to their cloud yeah. journey. And again, so, but, yeah, personally, you. it's a dream come true for me, honestly. But Carlos. Great moment. Good. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing the moment Karen, with you're us. here. I see how many times, uh, 10 p.m. my time, local time, your face on, on WebEx every week. So 
you guys are there. Thank you for all the work. And, and thank you for yeah. coming. Yeah. It's pretty thank late you. in the day, we understand. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.